Electric potential energy. This is the third kind of potential energy we've studied. The first one was gravitational potential energy and then elastic potential energy and now electric potential energy. Boxes one through eight show us what happens when a charge moves through an electric field. Imagine Probert starting at point A and moving to point B. One key point is the work done by the electric force is path independent. This means that the electric force itself is a conservative force. Only the displacement matters, not the path. Remember, the work done by a conservative force is independent of path, and a conservative force always conserves mechanical energy, which is the sum of kinetic and potential energies. In this example, a red ball moves from some height to the surface of the Earth along that blue path. The work Work done by the gravitational force on this ball depends only on the displacement from the ball's initial to final heights. Kinetic energies and potential energies change, but the net mechanical energy remains unchanged. Box 7 is an interesting wrinkle. When all particles are infinitely separated from one another, we say the potential energy of that situation is zero. Let's think this through for a minute. If I have two positive charges or two negative charges right next to each other, in other words, their separation distance is small, there is going to be a tremendous amount of mutual repulsive force between them. By association, there's going to be a huge amount of electrostatic potential energy. If I'm holding these two charges very close to each other and I suddenly let go, there's going to be a very large increase in their kinetic energy. The electrostatic potential energy gets converted into kinetic energy. The further apart these particles get from each other, the lower their mutual repulsion and the lower the electrostatic potential energy. Let's look at what happens if I have two oppositely charged particles that I'm holding right next to each other. This, conversely, represents a very low level of electrostatic potential energy. These particles want to be located next to each other. If I now increase their separation distance, the mutual attractive electrostatic force gets larger and so does the electrostatic potential energy. The electrostatic potential energy associated with two like charges is considered positive. The electrostatic potential energy associated with two opposite charges is considered negative. Here's where we introduce voltage. Notice that there are three terms that all mean the same thing. Electric potential, potential, and voltage all mean the same thing. I typically just try to use the term voltage for the sake of simplicity. There's the definition. Voltage is defined as electric potential energy per unit charge. Here's an analogy. In a plumbing system, a water pump takes low pressure water and boosts it to high pressure water so it flows out of your faucet at a nice rate. Now think of a battery as doing the same thing, only in this case a battery takes low voltage or low energy charges and boosts them to a higher voltage or higher energy stream of charges. We have a brand new unit to introduce. One volt, if we do the dimensional analysis, is a joule per coulomb. In box four, I'm taking the units for electric field strength, which is newtons per coulomb, and I'm running it through a series of conversions and seeing how it's equivalent to a volt per meter. This is really significant. It links electric field strength and voltage. We see that the electric field basically depends on the spatial rate of change of voltage. At the bottom of box four, you see that stated in a few different forms. Box five introduces yet another new unit, the electron volt. In many cases, it's a lot easier to deal with electron volts than it is with joules. Think of the unit EV as a concatenation, not an abbreviation, meaning that E stands for the fundamental charge E, the charge of a proton or the charge of an electron, for example. So think of EV as the product of E, the fundamental charge, and V, voltage, not an acronym. Next section, calculating the voltage from the field. We're basically going to reverse engineer what's going on with the electric field lines and from that derive voltage differences. Look at our picture. Probert travels from point I to point F along some random path through an electric field. Notice our two vectors. One is a differential displacement vector and the other is the electric field vector. Carefully step through boxes one through six and notice how we can derive voltage from the integral of E dot ds. So here again is the dot product, the product 
product of parallels. We only care about the component of the electric field that lies parallel with the differential displacement vector. Next section, equal potential or equal voltage surfaces. If Probert moves from point A to point B, there is a voltage drop. The more positive region is on the left side and the less positive region is on the right side and since Probert is a positive unit test charge, there is going to be a lowering of electrostatic potential energy. If Probert moves from point A to point C, there is also a voltage drop and it's the same voltage drop as Probert experienced going from point A to point B. That's because the electric field lines are uniform. If Probert goes from point C to point B or from point B to to point C, there is no change in Probert because the proximity to the more positive or less positive charge regions is not changing. So we say points B and C represent an equal potential surface. Check out the example in box number two. You're looking at four equipotential surfaces. Also notice that each of these four surfaces are being pierced by an electric field line. And note that the electric field line is always perpendicular to an equipotential surface. That's a very important point. Look at path one, Roman numeral one. Probert is moving on the first equipotential surface, but no work is occurring. No change in voltage means no change in potential energy means no work is happening. Look at path Roman number two. Probert starts on equipotential surface three, dips down to equipotential surface four, but then ends up back on equipotential three. The net change in voltage is zero, which means there's no work done. That's because Probert started and ended on the same equipotential surface. Roman numeral 3, Probert starts on V1 and ends up on V2. So Probert is going from a voltage of 100 volts to a voltage of 80 volts. That's a drop of 20 volts, which means the work done on Probert is a positive 20. Same with path Roman number 4. Probert starts on a equal potential voltage surface of 100 volts, meanders around a bit, but again ends up at an 80 volt equal potential surface. So in this case, the work done by the electric force is a positive 20 joules. The last box explains why electric field lines are always perpendicular to equal potential surfaces. Make sure you read this as many times as you need to really grasp this concept. Next section, voltage due to a point charge. Let's get smart about analyzing the voltage produced by a point source charge and use that as the basis for more complicated situations. For for example, multiple point source charges, which includes a dipole, or a line of charge, or a arc or ring of charge, and all the way up to a charged surface. If we know how to handle the analysis of the voltage produced by a point charge, we can use integral calculus and deal with any other combination of point charges. Here's a one nanocoulomb source charge. Here's the scalar voltage field surrounding that one nanocoulomb source charge. Here are the electric field vectors flowing out of that positive 1 nanocoulomb source charge. Here's an equal potential surface which is represented by a cross-sectional circle that corresponds to 6.830 volts. Look at my yellow test charge, that's Probert. No matter where Probert goes on that equal potential surface, Probert is always going to report a voltage of 6.830 volts. 6.830 volts there, 6.8 30 volts there and everywhere else along that equal potential surface which again is being represented by a two-dimensional cutaway path. Here are two point source charges. Think of this as a dipole. There's the scalar voltage field surrounding each charge. Notice the positive source charge produces a positive voltage field and the negative source charge produces a negative voltage field. Here are the electric field lines surrounding these charges. Notice how complicated it's getting. Here are several equal potential surfaces surrounding these two point source charges. Notice again the complexity of the shape. Notice also that the electric field lines are everywhere perpendicular to the equipotential
potential surfaces. And notice that there is a point between these two charges where the voltage is zero. There's a transition from a positive scalar voltage field to a negative scalar voltage field. Let's look at the drawing on the left side. Probert is starting out at point P at some distance, capital letter R, away from the positive source charge. Probert then travels to an infinite distance away from this positive source charge. Working through boxes one through eight, we end up with the expression that gives the voltage due to a single point source charge at a specific distance from that point source charge. Look at all eight boxes as if they're critical because they are as far as true and deep understanding are concerned. In box number one, you're just recycling an expression you already derived, but make sure you remember the derivation of that expression. In box two, really make sure you completely understand why the limits of integration are set to the values indicated. In box three, make sure you understand how E dot dr is equivalent to E dr cos theta. Box four, make sure you understand why theta equals zero. Box five, we're reusing a definition, so that's pretty straightforward. Box six is a pretty rudimentary update. Box seven, bring all constants to the left of the integrand. And in box eight, solve the integral and evaluate and make sure you get what's shown here in box eight. Don't just write it down, derive it yourself. Once again, a positive source charge produces a positive voltage field and a negative source charge produces a negative voltage field. Voltage due to a group of point charges, this is again using superposition. We basically just add the contribution of each source charge and come up with a net result at a given point in space away from the source charge or group of source charges. Once again, we're investigating a dipole because dipoles are really important. This section is the voltage due to an electric dipole. This is an interesting derivation. Note that in box two, we're using an approximate we can get away with this typically because the distance between the two source charges, the positive and the negative source charge, is almost always super small compared to our observation point or point P where Probert is sitting. It's as if you look at a drop of water sitting on your kitchen countertop. The distance between you and the water molecule dipoles is huge compared to the charge separation within those dipoles. Check out the scales of the universe app, it might give you some valuable perspective about the dimensions I'm talking about and why the approximation referenced in this derivation is probably pretty darned accurate. Box 2 also provides the expression for the voltage produced by an electric dipole at a distance r away from that dipole. And you might say, is this the distance from the positive charge or the negative charge? And the answer is it doesn't matter because those source charges are so close together with respect to our observation point that they can be considered one and the same as far as distance is concerned not in terms of their electrical effects. Also again, just to remind everyone, voltage is a scalar, it's not a vector. So typically working with voltages is a lot easier than dealing with electric fields since we don't have to worry about decomposing vectors into components and doing all sorts of vector operations. Voltage due to a continuous charge distribution. So here we step into substantially more complicated situations. Look at the drawing in the left. I have a non-conducting rod carrying a charge positive Q. Non Conducting is important to mention because these charges can't move. The object is charged, but the charges themselves are fixed in place. Probert is standing at a point P with respect to the charged line, and box seven gives us the expression for the voltage at that point in space with respect to this charged line. Make sure you work carefully through boxes one through seven. We've done this sort of derivation before. We start with a differential element. We know what's going on with that element because that element is always a point point source, and then we integrate. So the guiding principle is, again, probably for the 10th time, to capture the situation in terms of its geometry and material properties. I'm doing that in box one because lambda, which is linear charge density, is a material property. DQ is a point charge, and I know how to deal with point charges. That's the simplest case possible. Box two, I'm leaning on Pythagorean theorem, and again, my motivation is to capture the situation in terms of its geometry and material properties. 
Box 3 is the differentialized version of the voltage due to a source charge at some position R away. Box 4 I'm updating the expression in box 3. Box 5 I pull out the integrals and I set the limits of integration. Box 6 I solve that integral using calculus, an integral table, or a calculator. But to be honest, using a calculator might be the riskiest approach because it doesn't really allow for a lot of partial credit. And in box 7 I evaluate the solved integral. Let's now continue to a two-dimensional charged surface. Time to derive the voltage due to a charged disk. We're very interested in charged disks because they are part of capacitors. Box 7 gives us the net result for the voltage existing at point P, which is a distance Z away from a charged disk. Next section, calculating the field from the voltage. Previously, we calculated the voltage from the field, so now we're flipping the script. Look at the picture on the right. Probert is traveling through an electric field. This isn't necessarily a uniform electric field. You can see the field represented by the electric field vector, and then you can see a number of equipotential lines, or I should say equipotential surface lines. We're going to look at the component of the electric field vector that falls along the same path as Probert's differential displacement vector as you see. We end up at box 6 where we take partial differentials. For example, the electric field along some arbitrary direction S is equal to minus partial derivative of voltage with respect to S. The electric field along direction x equals negative partial v partial x and so on. So we say the electric field depends on the voltage gradient. The electric field in a given direction is a function of how the voltage field changes in that given direction. The negative sign is there because the electric field direction is opposite to the voltage gradient since the electric field always goes from a more positive to a less positive region. Boxes 8 and 9 provide provide some more background about how to interpret the expressions given in box 6 and 7 and what gradients really mean. Next section, electric potential energy of a system of point charges. We started off this entire chapter with an analysis of electric potential energy. Now we're going to look at the potential energy of a system of charges as you see here in the drawing on the left. Since all three of these point source charges are positive, they are each mutually repelling the others. Right now you're looking at a system containing a lot of electrostatic potential energy. If I kept charge Q1 fixed in place and moved charges 2 and 3 infinitely far away from Q1 and each other, that would represent zero potential energy. Think of a spring analogy. If I compress a spring, that represents a lot of elastic potential energy, and if I let that spring relax, that represents a decrease in the elastic potential energy. Next section positive or negative potential energy. This is basically giving us a convention to keep track of positive versus negative electrostatic potential energy and provides some deeper insights about how to think of the positive or negative nature of electrostatic potential energy. Last section, potential energy of a charged isolated conductor. We keep coming back to charged conductors for a reason. They have lots of practical applications. The arbitrary arbitrarily shaped charged conductor on the left shows all of its charges lying on its surface. That's because they want to get as far away from each other as possible. The electric field inside this charged conductor is zero because these charges basically figure out where to move so they are at rest. If they're at rest, that means they are not accelerating. If they're not accelerating, that means there's no forces. And if there are no forces, that means there is no electric field. That's one way to look at it. Number two says the electric field inside the conductor is zero and explains why. Number three reminds us that the electric field lines are everywhere perpendicular to the equipotential surface and the physical surface of this charged conductor is in fact an equipotential surface. No matter where Probert goes on the surface of this charged object, the electric field strength is going to be the same. The graph on the right is useful. It shows us that once again the electric field inside 
inside any conducting object is zero for the aforementioned reasons, and that the voltage is constant. The voltage is constant, but it's not zero. The voltage inside this charge conductor has the same value as the voltage at its surface. As Probert moves further away from this charged object, beyond its physical surface, you can see that there's a decrease in the measured voltage as a function of distance between Probert and the source charge itself. 